preface of memoir of washington irving by charles adams this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Memoir of Washington Irving by Charles Adams. Preface To the Honorable Jacob Sleeper, a friend of many years, this volume is affectionately and gratefully dedicated. The Life and Letters of Washington Irving in four volumes prepared by his nephew pierre m irving and published since the death of his illustrious uncle has been for several years before the public and may be considered a model work of its kind it seems quite certain however that a brief and direct history of irving such as would be comprised in a single volume of moderate size and including slight specimens of some of his more popular compositions would supply a positive desideratum and be an acceptable service especially to multitudes of our youth and others besides who would shrink from the expense of a much more voluminous biography washington irving was one of the distinguished fathers of american literature and his service in this field must ever be deemed of great and special importance to his country hence it has very seriously impressed the author of this little work that the history and many of the writings of irving should be as widely known as the language itself and to further such an object was a prominent purpose of these pages of course to the literati professional men and students of the country the eminent author and his works are sufficiently familiar at the same time to thousands of both sexes outside of these several classes the author of the sketch-book is still a stranger and to this day the magical pen he wielded has brought no instruction or amusement if therefore to such this unpretending volume shall tend to bring the distinguished writer and his works more prominently to notice and entice to a still wider perusal and study of them then will our humble effort not be in vain and what was remarked by edward everett in the north american review touching one of mr irving's volumes may be well applied to the majority of his published writings Quote, the american father who can afford it and does not buy a copy of tour on the prairies does not deserve that his son should prefer his fireside to the bar-room the pure and chaste pleasures of a cultivated taste to the gross indulgences of sense he does not deserve that his daughters should pass their leisure hours in maidenly seclusion in the improvement of their minds rather than to flaunt on the sidewalks by day and pursue by night an eternal round of tasteless dissipation End, quote. End of Preface Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida Chapter 1 of Memoir of Washington Irving by Charles Adams This LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by greg giordano chapter one it was a deeply interesting point in our history when washington irving was born the war of the revolution was just closing peace was dawning upon the land the independence for which the fathers had struggled so long and so manfully was about to be recognized by the mother country and the united states of america was now to commence as a nation its great and eventful career washington was born in april seventeen eighty three and grew to be very much such a boy as might be supposed from a contemplation of his developed manhood 
he was a sprightly buoyant witty somewhat mischievous yet not a vicious child deeply affectionate toward his parents especially his mother who as is natural felt a mother's pride in her son Quote, but it grieved her that he did not take more kindly to religion and at times in the midst of one of his effusions of wit and drollery she would look at him with a half mournful admiration and exclaim oh washington if you were only good End quote. the meaning of this wish doubtless was that her beloved child were religiously good that amid all his sprightliness and all his promising traits he were cherishing in his heart the fear of god and a joyful trust in his mercy through christ the saviour and as with a thoughtful and christian eye we trace the career of this child along his youth and riper years we cannot forbear the earnest regret that his mother's pious wish for her child had not been realized happy had it been as well for the world as for himself if god's holy spirit had been invited to enkindle right early that eminent genius and inspire for the highest good of the race that brilliant pen born as irving was just as the war ended it was eminently fit that a child so beautiful and promising should receive a name that had become so celebrated Quote, washington's work is ended said the mother and the child shall be named after him End quote and very pleasant and noteworthy is the incident that when the great washington returned to new york as president of the united states a scotch maid servant of the irving family accosted him one morning and pointing to the lad scarcely yet emerged from his virgin trousers exclaimed quote, please your honor here's a bairn was named for you End quote and washington placed his hand on the head of the little boy and gave him his blessing all this can hardly fail to remind us of a similar transaction when one infinitely greater than washington took little children up in his arms and blessed them the anecdotes told us of irving's early boyhood are highly characteristic and indicate to a considerable extent the genius and character of the forthcoming man at eleven years old we find him becoming much interested in certain kinds of reading among which books of voyages and travels held a conspicuous place by constant perusal of works of this character he became inflamed with a passion for going abroad to see the world for himself Quote, how wistfully said he would i wander about the pierheads in fine weather and watch the parting ships bound to distant climes with what longing eyes would i gaze after their lessening sails and waft myself in imagination to the ends of the earth End quote. a more damaging tendency and passion soon affected this ardent and talented boy having on one occasion attended a theatre he is represented as being so delighted with the acting that henceforth he felt and cherished special fondness for theatrical entertainments hence as we trace him through all his youthful years and in maturer life and amid his sojourning in one and another city at home or abroad we cannot help discerning that the theatre was one of the very prominent amusements in which he indulged it is painful too to notice that his early indulgence and pleasure in this species of amusement was the sweetness of stolen waters his attendance at the theatre being under parental interdict it is represented as his habit that he would go early and see the play then hurry home to prayers at the hour of nine retire afterward to his room as if for the night pass slyly out of his window and steal back to the theatre to witness the afterpiece after which he would return by the same way to his room let all boys remember that examples like this should never be imitated and that while the amusement itself with the usual accompaniments is more than doubtful his means of securing it and the disobedience prompting those means were a positive wrong and could never be reviewed 
with an approving conscience. A very important lesson for parents is also here. It is likely that for young and imaginative people few amusements present a stronger or more dangerous fascination than the theatre. Such youth, having once tasted this pleasure, long for its repetition, while the dangerous appetite quote, grows by what it feeds on, end quote, until many a strong tie, not accepting that of integrity itself, often yields to the fatal fascination of the siren. That young Irving was ever so sadly drawn into this vortex does not appear, save in the instance specified. But that the theatre formed one of the capital charms of his youthful years is painfully evident. How far this kind of indulgence and recreation operated to prevent him from early following his parents, in the way of piety cannot be estimated, but that an important influence was thus exerted in the direction alluded to seems morally certain. Young Irving was not liberally educated, and we trace him as a schoolboy, and in one and another school, until he reached the age of fifteen. At the last school which he attended, where he remained about eighteen months, he studied the Latin language, which seems to have been his nearest approach to a classical education. Mathematical studies appear not to have been pursued beyond common arithmetic, while well, this was, with him, one of the most irksome of his studies. In composition, as may well be supposed, he was far more interested and successful, a circumstance which seems to have often led him to exchange work with one and another of his mates, they working out his sums, and he writing out their compositions. Thus, before attaining his sixteenth year, was the school education of Washington Irving finished. It is certainly an interesting fact in the history of American literature that he who was recognized as one of its chief pioneers and fathers was himself but a self-educated man. For half a century have the thousands of undergraduates in our colleges seized eagerly upon the works of this man as their favorite author in the department of Belle Lettres, and he who, among the numerous college and public libraries, would light upon the books the most handled and worn of all others, must not overlook the fascinating volumes of Irving, nor is the charm attendant upon his pen that which affects merely the tyro in literature. The ripe and mature scholar roams with equal and even superior pleasure amid these gardens of beauty, and the great wizard of the north, with as much enthusiasm as the ardent youth amid his varied classic exercises, was wont to discuss, with no ordinary relish, the pleasant viands supplied by this extraordinary caterer of literary delights. How is all this? We may pause only to respond that it is not in colleges or college training, it is not in education, not in surroundings, not in smiles or sorrows, riches or poverty, not in travel, observation, or all learning and knowledge, it is in the man himself, and in something there which, like the century plant, blooms not every year, nor every generation. End of chapter 1 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Chapter 2 of Memoir of Washington Irving by Charles Adams This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Greg Giordano Chapter 2 At sixteen years of age, therefore, his school studies being finished, young Irving commenced the study of the law, or, rather, he entered a law office, sojourning there during two years, in which the study of belles lettres seemed to have been far more diligently and successfully pursued than that of law. Indeed, it is difficult to conceive of a youth less adapted to the studies and practice of law than he vastly more congenial with his temperament and tastes was it to be reveling amid the wild and beautiful scenery which stretched away in various directions from the city of his birth hence we see him gladly escaping from the law office with its 
arid studies in rough and thorny associations to commit himself with a friend or two to a long excursion up the hudson and among the then wild regions beyond far away above albany where at the beginning of the century was the frontier of civilization dwelt an elder sister who at a tender age had gone with her youthful husband to dwell amid these northern outskirts thither irving was bound it was the year eighteen hundred when steamboats and railroads were unknown and this was his first voyage up that noble stream whose shores were in after time to be made classic by the witchery of his pen and on whose banks would one day repose the lovely villa where after long and weary sojournings in foreign lands he would make his earthly resting-place long afterward he wrote of this early voyage and its pleasant experience there was the boy-like eagerness to embark the final floating away of the sloop from the wharf into the broad stream the exchange of adieus with friends ashore the grand scenery of the palisades the intense delight of that first sail through the highlands the overhanging forests the witching effect of the catskill mountains now seeming to approach the shore then receding and melting away into the hazy distance it was his lot in subsequent years to traverse some of the rivers of the old world and such as are renowned in history and song yet these he remarks were never able to efface or dim the pictures of his native stream so early stamped upon his memory he would always revert to them with a filial feeling and with a recurrence of the joyous associations of his boyhood a year or two afterward we find him in company with a friend on another excursion up the hudson at the springs and elsewhere at this time he is an invalid with consumptive symptoms and tendencies and he returns home with health still drooping and uncertain now it is when at nineteen years of age we trace the first movements of irving's pen with a view to publication they consist in a series of humorous contributions under the signature of jonathan old style and were published in the morning chronicle even these earliest attempts of his pen were popular and were extensively copied in the prints of the time and twenty years afterward when their author was abroad in europe and had now become famous they were without his consent or approbation collected and republished in the following summer irving was one of a very interesting party made up for an excursion to ogdensburg montreal and quebec this company comprised besides the subject of the sketch two highly respectable families consisting each of husband wife and daughter and the expedition must have promised of course no small amount of pleasure to the several parties and not the least to the young gentleman himself it proved a scene of much and varied adventure as usual their voyage up the river was by sloop arriving at albany we soon tracked them to saratoga and boston whence they make a flying visit to utica then in the wilderness then we see them in wagons struggling through the thick woods and muddy roads and blackened stumps and fallen trees matters wax worse and worse the travellers are now out walking in the mud then launched in a scow on beach river they are overwhelmed with torrents of rain then going ashore they lodge in a log hut on beds spread upon the floor in the morning they are off again upon the muddy stream anon in wagons once more blundering amid stumps and roots again stuck fast and the whole party taking to their feet the rain meanwhile descending in torrents young irving frequently up to his middle in mud and water amid the woods and mud and rain they seek to shelter the ladies in a little bark shed of capacity sufficient to hold three but half of it falls down as they attempt to creep under it and the rain falls in floods falls as they never have seen it fall before the wind blows a hurricane the trees shake and bend and crack and threaten every moment to fall and crush the frightened company 
they flee as from destruction dragging themselves along with painful difficulty until they again reach a hut their only lodging place suffice it to add that after other similar and hideous mishaps to their great joy they came in sight of oswegachi whose present name is ogdensburg fifty years afterward and when irving was seventy years of age he went and looked again upon this interesting locality there for a long time he sat his thoughts running back through the long vista of departed years and lighting upon the happy beings who fifty years before were with him there every one of them was now passed away and himself was the sole survivor of all that joyous company quietly and safely at home they had lived at home they had died while he still lived though amid these intervening years he had traversed seas and wandered over distant lands and encountered so many dangers and hardships it seemed wonderful to him as he sat there pensive and lonely and doubtless he wept amid those interesting and sombre memories and why in such a connection must there have been no recognition of that kind and favouring providence that had accompanied him and watched him and shielded him at every step of his long and various wanderings there sat that man of seventy years a long and prosperous life had been his his name had become world-renowned his fame world-wide few mortals had been so extensively honored loved and caressed as he every circumstance was adapted to point him to the divine hand how graceful would have been an ascription of praise and how graceful too as well as tasteful would have been its public record end of chapter two recording by greg giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida. Chapter Three of Memoir of Washington Irving by Charles Adams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Memoir of Washington Irving by Charles Adams. Chapter Three at twenty-one years of age washington irving was a young gentleman of more than ordinary interest his portrait of about this period of his life while a slightly boyish aspect seems still to linger with him presents a countenance singularly well formed and comely his forehead was full high expansive and partially and gracefully shaded by flowing locks of hair carelessly curling around it his calm and expressive eyes were overarched by eyebrows of perfect regularity, his nose nearly straight, and formed with classic and faultless gracefulness, his mouth rather small, with lips full, and slightly elevated at their extremities, and thus hinting at that rich vein of humour for which he was so remarkable, chin long yet finely tuned, the head lofty, and clothed with abundant hair carelessly worn the entire tout ensemble conveying to us the impression that this must have been a youth of rare personal beauty and attractiveness harmonious with his fine personal appearance were his mental accomplishments and the kindly and genial elements of his social character his talents as a writer had already begun to be apparent while his conversational powers were similar to what he ascribed to one of his brothers being characterized by rich, mellow humor, range of anecdote, quick sensibility, and fine colloquial flow. No wonder that such a youth was the idol of the family circle, or that he began to attract the attention and interest of a constantly widening circle of friends. But, alas, this beautiful youth came up to his majority smitten with disease. His consumptive tendencies have already been alluded to, and evident alarm on his account was now beginning to be felt by his numerous friends and especially those of his own father's family how could such a son and brother as this be given up to disease decline and death must such a star of beauty set so soon and shall a luminary rising so brilliantly 
be quenched in quick and cold eclipse it must not be this child of promise must be rescued from the destroyer and for a boon so precious as his health and life he must be given up for a season and sent abroad to a foreign land it is with delight wrote his eldest brother to him after his departure for europe that we share the world with you and one of our greatest sources of happiness is that fortune is daily putting it in our power thus to add to the comfort and enjoyment of one so very near to us all no wonder that he was heavy-hearted as he sailed away and as he saw the spires of the city sink from his view that day was melancholy and lonesome and as at night he turned into his berth he was sick at heart such is sometimes the low estate befalling frail and helpless man abroad upon the dark and heaving ocean reclining that night in his lowly berth an invalid youth his life hanging as if by a thread wafted each moment farther from the friends and home he loves bound to a land of strangers unknown unheeded sick faint and sad will he ever rally and will brighter and more prosperous days ever rise on his vision to gladden his sinking sorrowing heart but irving's characteristic elasticity prevailed and giving thanks to the fountain of health and good spirits he presently revived from his state of dullness and discouragement arose above his homesickness while anticipating the classic and pleasant scenes he was about to enjoy in a foreign land he went on his way with cheerful and joyful steps after a pleasant voyage with mild and gentle weather and but a few hours of seasickness our traveller arrived at bordeaux and as he contemplated the buildings ancient churches and the manners of the people he seemed to himself to have come to another world end of chapter three Recording by Maria Casper. Chapter Four of Memoir of Washington Irving by Charles Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four Irving remained several weeks at Bordeaux, improving himself in the French language. Here also he commenced a copious journal noting down in pencil marks whatever interested him designing to expand and perfect them in his intervals of leisure his journey from bordeaux to paris was quite circuitous and somewhat eventful he starts off in the old cumbersome french diligence and the route is up along the banks of the garonne among his fellow travellers is a little doctor an american brimful of animation and overflowing with good nature and talk knowing everything and with whom ambassadors consuls etc were intimate acquaintances this new acquaintance being an experienced traveller proved to be frequently useful to irving as well as a continual fund of amusement and on parting with him at Mays, he at once began to realise the loss he thus sustained with much pleasure however he encounters the little doctor again at montpellier and remarks i shall travel in company with him and by that means be protected from extortion i find he is a more important character than i at first supposed from marseilles the two travellers journeyed on together to nice where after a miserable red tape detention of five weeks irving sailed to genoa here he saluted with great delight an old acquaintance and friend from new york you he writes to a friend at home who have never been from home in a land of strangers and for some time without friends cannot conceive the joy the rapture of meeting with a favorite companion in a distant part of the world genoa proved to irving a sunny and delightful haven and especially after so many difficulties and detentions in reaching it here he seems to have gained access to the most elevated and refined society contracted many valuable friendships and as may be reasonably supposed was a special favorite among the more gay and fashionable circles of that renowned city weeks and months he lingered amid these pleasant associations and expresses himself as so far from being weary that he every day became more and more delighted with his sojourn there meantime health he writes has new strung my limbs 
and endowed me with an elasticity of spirits that gilds every scene with sunshine and heightens every enjoyment footnote a singular faculty this young gentleman must certainly have possessed of introducing himself into the higher circles of society wherever he travels that this should have been altogether facile and natural after he had become famous in authorship is easy to perceive but how as an unknown and untitled young stranger he secured such an advantage is more mysterious he seems from the very outset to have walked up among the nobles of every land he visits as if he were one of them and to the manner born End footnote. irving now embarked for sicily leaving sweet genoa and all its friendly inhabitants behind him arriving he visited several of the principal cities of that famous island touching at messina he sailed to syracuse and having among other curious objects visited the famous ear of dionysius the tyrant he journeyed north to catania and ascended mount etna as far as his guide would accompany him thence by a dismal journey across the island he visited palermo and then embarked for naples arriving there he found to his great delight an abundance of letters from home some interesting friends also greeted him here with a party of whom he made a night visit to vesuvius at that time in a state of eruption and came near being overwhelmed with dense torrents of the most noxious smoke the crowd and bustle of naples was not to the taste of our traveller and he gladly bade it adieu that he might repose himself in the silent retreats of rome here also he found several of his countrymen among whom was washington alston the artist alston was a native of south carolina born in seventeen seventy nine he was a slender child and his parents were advised to send him north to enjoy its more bracing airs he was accordingly sent to newport rhode island at seven years of age and placed at school where he continued for ten years he early evinced a genius for painting receiving some aid and encouragement from a mr king who had enjoyed a partial artistic education a more important acquaintance formed by the young alston was edward malbone a native of newport who evinced much promise as a miniature painter these two youths seem to have formed a mutual friendship and malbone afterwards residing in boston while alston was in college at harvard their intimacy was continued through a series of years from malbone alston derived much advantage in his earlier efforts as an artist his leisure was occupied with sketches copying and drawing and though having but few helps he soon attained a wonderful degree of knowledge in the higher elements of the painting art on his graduation he returned to his home in the south where he found his friend malbone occupied with the practice of his art and shortly afterward the two friends embarked for london with a view of improving themselves in art studies alston at once entered the royal academy as a student and became intimate with the artist benjamin west here he devoted himself for several years with great diligence and success to artistic studies it was here that irving and alston first met and became attached to each other in a warm and lifelong friendship alston was three or four years the senior of irving and the latter describes his friend as being peculiarly agreeable having a form light and graceful large blue eyes black silken hair waving and curling around a pale expressive countenance he adds that everything about him bespoke the man of intellect and refinement his conversation was copious animated and highly graphic warmed by a genial sensibility and benevolence and enlivened by a chaste and gentle humor footnote alston subsequently spent several years in italy returned home in 1809, married a sister of Dr. Channing, and returned to London, where he resided for a term of years and executed many paintings of distinguished excellence. Returning to the United States in 1818, he passed the remainder of his life in Boston and Cambridge, in slender health, yet exercising as he was able his cherished art. His principal work, however, Belshazzar's Feast, he left unfinished, and died in 1848 at the age of 64. 
End footnote. It is a curious fact that Irving's intimate association with Alston, joined with the beautiful Italian scenery, pictures, statuary, fountains, and gardens, had at this time well nigh influenced him to turn his attention to painting, and like his friend, devote himself to it as a life pursuit. But a wise providence seems to have overruled this arrangement, that he might become a master in a different department of the world of art. My lot in life, said he, was differently cast. Doubts and fears gradually clouded over my prospect. The rainbow tints faded away. I began to apprehend a sterile reality. So I gave up the transient but delightful prospect of remaining in Rome with Alston and turning painter. Before leaving Rome, Irving made the acquaintance of Madame de Stael, whom he describes as a woman of great strength of mind and understanding, and was astounded at the amazing flow of her conversation. This distinguished lady was a native of Paris, born in 1766, and was consequently not quite forty years old when Irving became acquainted with her at Rome. Her father, Baron de Necker, was a wealthy Swiss banker, whom she loved almost to idolatry. She was well educated, and being early thrown into the society of distinguished persons, she soon acquired the art of brilliant conversation, which was so impressive and surprising to Irving, and for which she was excelled by no lady of her time. She early became an authoress, and when twenty-two years of age appeared her first work, Letters on the Works and Character of Rousseau, which was highly eulogistic of that celebrated person. It was not until a year or two after Irving's interview with her that she published the work on which her literary reputation mainly rests. This was her Corinne, a work having some marked faults, yet full of elegant descriptions of the scenery, manners, and art of the classic land of Italy. This work was at once immensely popular, and was soon translated into all the European languages, and won for the fair authoress a widespread reputation. Footnote. Many other works came from the graceful and facile pen of Madame de Stael, and her fame and influence became very extensive. For a time she favored the French Revolution, but as it progressed, and more and more developed its cruel and bloody character, her womanly nature revolted against it. She was horror-struck at the murder of the king and queen. As Napoleon arose into power, she was his inveterate opposer. He attempted to gain her over to his cause, but failing, and dreading her influence, he banished her from France. During her exile she travelled over many countries of Europe, and her pen, meanwhile, was active. On the fall of Bonaparte she returned to Paris, and died there in 1817. She was twice married, first to Baron de Stahl Holstein, Swedish minister to the French court, and afterward, secretly, to Monsieur de Roca, a French officer. She was the mother of four children. End footnote. Mr. Irving now left Rome on his route to Paris, and reached that city after a journey occupying about six weeks. Here he continued four months, and from a few entries in his journal we may infer that while he professed to his brother a desire to profit by the literary and scientific advantages presented to him there, he was fully as earnest after lighter pursuits. The theatre, opera, and the dance were amusements to which he was evidently much devoted. His journalistic pencilings grew increasingly meagre and unsatisfactory, and finally ceased entirely while the impressions of Paris upon his youthful and ardent mind seem to have been as vivid as they were fascinating and beautiful. For pleasure and amusements it was a place the most favorable and attractive in the world. Climate, theaters, operas, walks, people, perfect liberty of private conduct, all were admirably adapted to pleasure and gaiety. I, and admirably adapted, too, we fear, to beguile young men away from correct principles, and from lives of respectability and virtue. End of chapter four. Recording by Maria Casper. Chapter five of Memoir of Washington Irving by Charles Adams. This LibriVox recording 
is in the public domain recording by greg giordano chapter five after four months residence in paris where he had improved himself very considerably in his knowledge of the french language and had become partially satiated with the endless round of amusements so bountifully afforded by that dissipated metropolis irving in company with two american friends departed for london their route lay through brussels and maastricht to rotterdam they pausing a day or two at each of these cities and contemplating with deep interest the prodigious contrast between the frenchman and the hollander in appearance houses manners language and tastes from rotterdam they came by packet to the mouth of the thames whence by post chase they passed up to london our traveller at once adapted his dress to his new situation secured eligible and comfortably furnished lodgings partially retired from the bustle and confusion of the city yet near many desirable places of resort among which the theatres are carefully included thus the theatre is still prominent in the affections and plans of this youth and his letters to one another give full evidence of his absorbing interest in this class of amusements he became deeply interested in the performers their appearance action and general manners entering into somewhat minute descriptions of them and presenting various criticisms and such as betray his devotion to theatrical amusements it was now that irving saw and heard for the first time the famous mrs siddons one of the most distinguished actresses of the day here he is full and overflowing with enthusiasm he fears to give expression to all his emotions she is a wonderful woman her looks voice gestures all go directly to his heart which is frozen and melted by turns and his frame is thrilled through and through even with a single glance or gesture he admires her the more he sees her he hardly breathes when she is upon the stage and she overwhelms him till he is a mere child footnote mrs siddons was of a distinguished family of actors she was daughter of roger kemble was born in wales in 1753 and was bred to the stage she was at eighteen years of age married to a young actor mr siddons and for thirty years was queen of the stage irving's description of her power accords with all reports of her wonderful acting she appeared says harlot to belong to a superior order of beings to be surrounded with a personal awe like some prophetess of old it was in bursts of indignation or grief in sudden exclamations in apostrophes and inarticulate sounds that she raised the soul of passion to its height or sunk it in despair it is said that so complete was her stage abstraction that the very actors performing with her have been known to shrink with terror from her fierce disdain or withering scorn she was greatly esteemed in all the relations of life she died in london in eighteen thirty one at the age of seventy six the same age of irving's decease and of footnote mr irving seems to have made comparatively few acquaintances in london and having made a brief excursion to oxford bath and bristol he after a sojourn of three months in the land of his forefathers embarked at gravesend for new york where he arrived after an absence of twenty-two months he returned home with restored health and in excellent spirits and resumed after his manner the study of law from the picture of washington irving's life and habits about this time as drawn by himself he seems to have been a somewhat fast young man and in associations with several other cheerful and jovial spirits indulged himself now and then in gaieties and convivialities hardly consistent with a genuine circumspection and sobriety of conduct in november following his return from europe and at twenty-three years of age he was admitted to the bar though sadly deficient in legal lore but he seems never to have entered on the practice of the profession and within a month or two after his admission to the bar he in connection with his brother william and james k balding projected a periodical publication to be entitled 
Zamagundi. This paper seems to have been issued once in two or three weeks, comprised twenty numbers, and continued to be issued through one year. Irving and Paulding appear to have shared about equally in the making up of the paper, the part of William Irving in the enterprise being somewhat subordinate. The writers appeared under fictitious names, and the compositions were characterized by wit, drollery, and satire, while the sensation among New York circles, produced by the several issues, was said to be intense, and its success was decided. Why it was so soon and suddenly discontinued, and the enterprise abandoned, is not very apparent. While its early death seems not to have been in accordance with the wishes and plans of Irving, the work has, by able critics, been pronounced a production of more than ordinary merit, and one writer represents it as the literary parent not only of the sketchbook in the Alhambra, but of all the intermediate and subsequent productions of Irving. Mr. Irving himself, however, failed to acquiesce in these and similar sentiments touching this literary effort of his youth, and in his mature years valued himself but slightly for a share in it. Quote, the work, he writes to a friend, was pardonable as a juvenile production, but it is full of errors, peculiarities, and imperfections, and I was, in hopes it would gradually have gone down to oblivion. End, quote. End of chapter 5 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Chapter 6 of Memoir of Washington Irving by Charles Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Greg Giordano. Chapter 6 But a specimen or two of Salmagunda we must endeavor to rescue from immediate oblivion, if only to present a slight picture of Irving when his pen was wielded by him in the freshness of his youth. Anthony Green, gentleman, is one of Irving's assumed names in these compositions, and Anthony thus dresses up Will Wizard for attendance at a ball. Quote, On calling for Will in the evening, I found him full-dressed, waiting for me. I contemplated him with an absolute dismay, as he still retained a spark of regard for the lady who once reigned in his affections he had been at unusual pains in decorating his person and broke upon my sight arrayed in the true style that prevailed among our beaux some years ago his hair was turned up and tufted at the top frizzled out at the ears a profusion of powder puffed over the whole and a long plaited club swung gracefully from shoulder to shoulder describing a pleasing semicircle of powder and pomatum his claret-colored coat was decorated with a profusion of gilt buttons and reached to his calves his white kerseymoor small clothes were so tight that he seemed to have grown up in them and his ponderous legs which are the thickest part of his body were beautifully clothed in sky-blue silk stockings once considered so becoming but above all he prided himself upon the, his waistcoat of china silk which might almost have served a good housewife for a short gown and he boasted that the roses and tulips upon it were the works of hang fao daughter of the great chin chin fao who had fallen in love with the graces of his person and sent it to him as a parting present End quote. will wizard's dancing is pictured thus quote, the music struck up from an adjoining apartment and summoned the company to the dance the sound seemed to have an inspiring effect on honest will and he procured the hand of an old acquaintance for a country dance it happened to be the fashionable one of the devil among the tailors which is so vociferously demanded at every ball and assembly and many a torn garment and many an unfortunate toe did rue the dancing of that night for will thundered down the dance like a coach and six sometimes right sometimes wrong now running over half a score of little frenchmen and now making sad inroads 
into the ladies' cobweb muslins and spangled tails. As every part of Will's body partook of the exertion, he shook from his capacious head such volumes of powder that, like pious Aeneas on the first interview of Queen Dido, he might be said to have been enveloped in a cloud, nor was Will's partner an insignificant figure in the scene. She was a young lady of most voluminous proportions, that quivered at every skip, and, being braced up in the fashionable style, with whalebone, stay-tape, and buckram, looked like an apple pudding tied in the middle, or, taking her flaming dress into consideration, like a bed and bolsters rolled up in a suit of red curtains. End quote. We add one or two extracts from the description of Charity Cockloft. Quote, My Aunt Charity departed this life in the fifty-ninth year of her age, though she never grew older after twenty-five. In her teens she was, according to her own account, a celebrated beauty, though I never could meet with anybody that remembered when she was handsome. On the contrary, Evergreen's father, who used to gallant her in his youth, says she was as naughty a little piece of humanity as he ever saw, and that, if she had been possessed of the least sensibility, she would, like poor old Echo, have most certainly run mad at her own figure and faced the first time she contemplated herself in a looking-glass. It is rather singular that my aunt, though a great beauty and an heiress withal, never got married. The reason she alleged was that she never met with a lover who resembled Sir Charles Grandison, the hero of her nightly dreams and waking fancy. But I am privately of opinion that it was owing to her never having had an offer. This much is certain, that for many years previous to her decease, she declined all attentions from the gentleman, and contented herself with watching over the welfare of her fellow creatures. She was, indeed, observed to take a considerable leaning toward Methodism, was frequent in her attendance at love feasts, read Whitfield and Wesley, and even went so far as once to travel the distance of five and twenty miles to be present at a camp meeting. This gave great offense to my cousin Christopher and his good lady, who, as I have already mentioned, are rigidly orthodox, and, had not my Aunt Charity been of a most pacific disposition, her religious whim-wham would have occasioned many a family altercation. But the truth must be told, with all her good qualities, my Aunt Charity was afflicted with one fault, extremely rare among her gentle sex, it was curiosity. How she came by it, I am at a loss to imagine, but it played the very vengeance with her, and destroyed the comfort of her life having an invincible desire to know everybody's character, business, and mode of living. She was forever prying into the affairs of her neighbors, and got a great deal of ill-will from people toward whom she had the kindest disposition possible. If any family on the opposite side of the street gave a dinner, my aunt would mount her spectacles and sit at the window until the company were all housed, merely that she might know who they were. If she heard a story about any of her acquaintance, she would forthwith set full sail, and never rest until, to use her usual expression, she had got to the bottom of it, which meant nothing more than telling it to everybody she knew. End, quote. End of chapter six. Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Chapter 7 of Memoir of Washington Irving by Charles Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Shortly after the Salamagundi papers ceased to be issued, a literary work of greater pretensions, and destined to a far greater fame, began to employ the pen of Irving. The conception was that of a burlesque and humorous history of New York and in the commencement of the composition his brother peter was associated with him in the enterprise circumstances however rendering it inconvenient for his brother to continue his assistance the entire preparation of the work devolved upon washington who brought it to a conclusion and gave it to the publisher in the fall of eighteen o nine when its author was twenty-six years of age <laughs> 
this remarkable book like all the subsequent works of irving is too well known to need a word of remark or criticism here a contemporaneous and able notice of the work pronounced it the wittiest that had ever been issued from the american press of course it was a positive success and its author at once became famous the history purported to be the work of a little dried-up quaint and mysterious old gentleman diedrich knickerbocker by name he was dressed in an old shabby black coat and cocked hat a pair of olive velvet breeches with silver shoe buckles and was set down by his landlady as a country schoolmaster he had been a lodger as it was further purported at the columbian hotel mulberry street new york and suddenly disappearing had left behind him in his room however the manuscript of this famous history which was represented as being published to defray the expense of his hotel lodgings the work abounds in humor and drollery from beginning to end and in this respect is excelled by few if any works of a similar character and aim that were ever published blackwood's magazine noticing the book several years after its first appearance affirmed that the matter of the work would preserve its character of value long after the lapse of time had blunted the edge of the personal allusions and that its author was by far the greatest genius which had appeared upon the literary horizon of the new world edward everett in the north american review pronounced it a book of unwearying pleasantry which instead of flashing out as english and american humor is wont from time to time with long and dull intervals is kept up with a true french vivacity from beginning to end sir walter scott receiving a copy of the history from a friend of irving in acknowledging the present adds among other things i have been employed these few evenings in reading it aloud to mrs scott and two other ladies who are guests and our sides have been absolutely sore with laughing the style of the work is entirely characteristic and differs little from that of the author's subsequent works it is easy simple flowery sparkling with vivacity brilliant with imagery and not sparing in classical and historical allusions some of which are of a character that sets us wondering where and when this youth of twenty-six years and partially uneducated could have acquired the learning with which he seems to be so familiar the various portraits of men and manners are of course of a burlesque and exaggerated character while yet they are valuable as affording us a glimpse at least of the social scenery of the good old times of the dutch dynasty it is a curious and laughable fact that some of the old families of dutch descent seem for a time to have taken this book in high dudgeon being deeply incensed at the caricatures which it appeared to comprise of one or another of their venerated ancestors so profound in one instance was this feeling that mr irving being at albany soon after its publication and receiving many attentions and civilities there one lady however was of a very different bearing toward him and declared that if she were a man she would horsewhip him irving on hearing of this was greatly amused and forthwith sought an introduction to the lady she received him with great coldness but before the interview ended she became entirely mollified and the two were excellent friends irving seems to have realized subsequently the delicate character of the ground he was traversing in his famous history and remarked to a friend that it was a confounded impudent thing in such a youngster as i was to be meddling in this way with old family names but i did not dream of offence the truth seems to have been that in constructing his work the author rallied together indiscriminately all the old dutch names that he had ever read or heard of and invented a host of others besides that were new to every one and wove them into his work without the slightest personal allusion in a single sentence he doubtless supposed that an antiquity of two centuries equivalent to thrice that amount of time in old countries would avail to place his several characters at a distance too remote for any criticism or blame connected with such a work as his arising from any family pride of ancestry End of chapter 7
Chapter 8 of Memoir of Washington Irving by Charles Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. We devote a brief chapter to one or two extracts from the history of New York. The following is a description of one of the Dutch governors. The renowned Wouter or Walter Van Twiller was descended from a long line of Dutch burgomasters who had successively dozed away their lives and grown fat upon the bench of magistracy in Rotterdam, and who had comported themselves with such singular wisdom and propriety that they were never either heard of or talked of, which, next to being universally applauded, should be the object of ambition of all magistrates and rulers. There are two opposite ways by which some men make a figure in the world, one by talking faster than they think, and the other by holding their tongues and not thinking at all. By the first, many a smatterer acquires the reputation of a man of quick parts. By the other, many a dunderpate, like the owl, the stupidest of birds, comes to be considered the very type of wisdom. This, by the way, is a casual remark, which I would not for the universe have it thought I am applying to Governor Van Twiller. It is true he was a man shut up within himself, like an oyster, and rarely spoke, except in monosyllables, but then it was allowed he seldom said a foolish thing. So invincible was his gravity that he was never known to laugh, or even to smile, through the whole course of a long and prosperous life. Nay, if a joke were uttered in his presence that set light-minded hearers in a roar, it was observed to throw him into a state of perplexity. Sometimes he would deign to inquire into the matter, and when, after much explanation, the joke was made as plain as a pikestaff, he would continue to smoke his pipe in silence, and at length, knocking out the ashes, would exclaim, Well, I see nothing in all that to laugh about. With all his reflective habits, he never made up his mind on a subject. His adherents accounted for this by the astonishing magnitude of his ideas. He conceived every subject on so grand a scale that he had not room in his head to turn it over and examine both sides of it. Certain it is that if any matters were propounded to him on which ordinary mortals would rashly determine at first glance, he would put on a vague, mysterious look, shake his capacious head, smoke some time in profound silence, and at length observe that he had his doubts about the matter which gained him the reputation of a man slow of belief and not easily imposed upon. What is more, it gained him a lasting name, for to this habit of mind has been attributed his surname of Twiller, which is said to be a corruption of the original Twiffler, or in plain English, Doubter. The person of this illustrious old gentleman was formed and proportioned as though it had been moulded by the hands of some cunning Dutch statuary as a model of majesty and lordly grandeur. He was exactly five feet six inches in height, and six feet five inches in circumference. His head was a perfect sphere, and of such stupendous dimensions that Dame Nature, with all her sex's ingenuity, would have been puzzled to construct a neck capable of supporting it. Wherefore she wisely declined the attempt, and settled it firmly on the top of his backbone, just between the shoulders. His body was oblong, and particularly capacious at bottom, which was wisely ordered by Providence, seeing that he was a man of sedentary habits, and very averse to the idle labor of walking. His legs were short, but sturdy in proportion to the weight they had to sustain, so that when erect he had not a little the appearance of a beer-barrel on skids. His face, that infallible index of the mind, presented a vast expanse, unfurrowed by any of those lines and angles which disfigure the human countenance with what is termed expression. Two small gray eyes twinkled feebly in the midst, like two stars of lesser magnitude in a hazy firmament, and his full-fed cheeks, which seemed to have taken toll of everything that went into his mouth, were curiously mottled and streaked, with dusky red, like a Spitzenberg apple. The successor of Walter the Doubter is thus described. Wilhelmus Kieft, who in 1634 ascended the gubernatorial chair, was of a lofty descent, his father being inspector of windmills in the ancient town of Sardam, and in 
and our hero, we are told, when a boy, made very curious investigations into the nature and operations of these machines, which was one reason why he came to be governor. His name, according to the most authentic etymologists, was a corruption of Kiver, that is to say, a wrangler or scolder, and expressed the characteristic of his family, which for nearly two centuries had kept the windy town of Sardam in hot water, and produced more tartars and brimstones than any ten families in the place. And so truly did he inherit this family peculiarity, that he had not been a year in the government of the province before he was universally denominated William the Testy. His appearance answered to his name. He was a brisk, wiry, waspish little old gentleman, such a one as may now and then be seen stamping about our city in a broad-skirted coat with huge buttons, a cocked hat stuck on the back of his head, and a cane as high as his chin. His face was broad, but his features were sharp. His cheeks were scorched into a dusky red by two fiery little gray eyes. His nose turned up, and the corners of his mouth turned down, pretty much like the muzzle of an irritable dog. A well-dressed lady of the golden age of the Dutch dynasty is thus presented. A fine lady in those times waddled under more clothes, even on a fair summer's day, than would have clad the whole bevy of a modern ballroom. Nor were they the less admired by the gentlemen in consequence thereof. On the contrary, the greatness of a lover's passion seemed to increase in proportion to the magnitude of its object, and a voluminous damsel, arrayed in a dozen of petticoats, was declared by a low Dutch sonneteer of the province to be radiant as a sunflower, and luxuriant as a full-blown cabbage. Certain it is that in those days the heart of a lover could not contain more than one lady at a time, whereas the heart of a modern gallant has often room enough to accommodate half a dozen, the reason of which I conclude to be that either the hearts of the gentlemen have grown larger, or the persons of the ladies smaller. This, however, is a question for physiologists to determine. The truly fashionable gentleman of those days is presented as follows. His dress, which served for both morning and evening, street and drawing-room, was a linsey woolsey coat, made perhaps by the fair hands of the mistress of his affections, and gallantly bedecked with abundance of large brass buttons. Half a score of breeches heightened the proportions of his figure. His shoes were decorated by enormous copper buckles. A low-crowned, broad-brimmed hat overshadowed his burly visage, and his hair dangled down his back in a prodigious queue of eel-skin. Thus equipped, he would manfully sally forth, with pipe in mouth, to besiege some fair damsel's obdurate heart. Not such a pipe, good reader, as that which Assis did sweetly tune in praise of his Galatea, but one of true Delft manufacture, and furnished with a charge of fragrant tobacco. With this he would resolutely set himself down before the fortress, and rarely failed in the process of time to smoke the fair enemy into surrender. We have the following picture of the Puritan New Englanders, a horde of strange barbarians bordering upon the eastern frontier. Now it so came to pass that many years previous to the time of which we are treating, the sage cabinet of England had adopted a certain national creed, a kind of public walk of faith, or rather a religious turnpike, in which every loyal subject was directed to travel to Zion, taking care to pay the toll-gatherers by the way. Albeit a certain shrewd race of men, being very much given to indulge their own opinions on all manner of subjects, a propensity exceedingly offensive to your governments of Europe, did most presumptively dare to think for themselves in matters of religion, exercising what they considered a natural and unextinguishable right, the liberty of conscience. As, however, they possessed that ingenuous habit of mind which always thinks aloud, which rides cock-a-hoop on the tongue, and is forever galloping into other people's ears, it naturally followed that their liberty of conscience likewise implied liberty of speech, which being freely indulged soon put the country in a hubbub, and aroused the pious indignation of the vigilant fathers of the church. 
the usual methods were adopted to reclaim them which in those days were considered efficacious in bringing back stray sheep to the fold that is to say they were coaxed they were admonished they were menaced they were buffeted line upon line precept upon precept lash upon lash here a little there a great deal were exhorted without mercy and without success until the worthy pastors of the church wearied out by their unparalleled stubbornness were driven in the excess of their tender mercy to adopt the scripture text and literally to heap live embers on their heads nothing however could subdue that independence of the tongue which has ever distinguished this singular race so that rather than subject that heroic member to further tyranny they one and all embarked for the wilderness of america to enjoy unmolested the inestimable right of talking and in fact no sooner did they land upon the shore of this free-spoken country than they all lifted up their voices and made such a clamour of tongues that we are told they frightened every bird and beast out of the neighbourhood and struck such mute terror into certain fish that they have been called dumb fish ever since this may appear marvellous but it is nevertheless true in proof of which i would observe that the dumb fish has ever since become an object of superstitious reverence and forms the saturday's dinner of every true yankee the simple aborigines of the land for a while looked upon these strange folk in utter astonishment but discovering that they wielded harmless though noisy weapons and were a lively ingenious good-humoured race of men they became very friendly and sociable and gave them the name of yanokis which in the Massachusetts or massachusetts language signifies silent men a waggish appellation since shortened into the familiar epithet of yankees which they retain unto the present day end of chapter eight recording by maria casper chapter nine of memoir of washington irving by charles adams this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by greg giordano it may appear remarkable that so decided a literary and financial success as the history of new york joined with the fact of the author's youth should not have immediately stimulated him to renewal and active enterprise in authorship one secret of all this was a seemingly curious blending in his nature of sprightliness and activity with a species of careless indolence he belonged not to that class of writers who in the language of dr johnson set themselves doggedly to the use of the pen he was more a creature of impulse of frames and feelings he had a horror of being obliged to use his pen he coveted to write as a man of leisure and dreaded the idea of dependence upon authorship for a livelihood he loved to write under a sort of inspiration he hated composition as a task but there was another and probably a deeper reason for the pause of his pen as the final page of the history was written it is well known that washington irving lived and died a bachelor but to use an expression of his own he was never intended for such a life and with this sentiment so frankly avowed by himself all who have familiarized themselves with the man through his writings will be inclined to acquiesce it would be judged through this medium that no one was more fitted for the duties and happiness of domestic life than he his respect and esteem for the fair sex were sincere and profound and it is easy to see that he was with ladies a universal favourite handsome in form and in feature of warm and genial temperament naturally graceful in movement and manners eminently social and possessing conversational powers as remarkable as they were animated and fascinating with fine intellectual faculties and accomplishments with an acknowledged genius in authorship even in his youth and challenging for himself a reputation for uprightness and virtue without a blemish it could not be otherwise than that this refined young gentleman would be an object of interest and attraction in the eyes of more than one of the elegant ladies 
with whom it was his lifelong habit to associate one of these indeed he loved and was beloved in return precisely how long this mutual attachment had existed does not appear but it was an established fact about the time of the completion of the knickerbocker history the young lady matilda hoffman was a daughter of the gentleman in whose office irving had pursued his law studies and the plans and hopes of the young couple seemed to have met the approval of their respective family circles but in the midst of all their bright hopes and anticipations matilda hoffman sickened and died in her eighteenth year and left her lover broken-hearted and the dearest hope of his life was forever overthrown so unspeakable and profound was his sorrow that he almost never spoke of it nor spoke nor alluded to the precious name of his lost matilda nor from all his voluminous writings could it be gathered that such an attachment had ever existed and many a one that saw and knew the man only in his writings has felt that he was indeed not intended for a bachelor and wondered that his genial and apparently sunny life thus glided away in solitude but we know not his whole heart nor discern the beautiful image there was early buried there in which no subsequent vision of loveliness and goodness could ever displace under such circumstances how increasingly admirable appear the life and career of irving thousands under a similar adversity have drooped and fainted and all the sunshine of their life was lost in cold and dire eclipse and they never took hold of strength more and thus were numbered among the lost lives not so with the subject of this story he mourned deeply mourned perchance through all his affluence of humour blithesomeness and gaiety and for aught we know his inmost heart was bleeding even when penning some one of his most cheery and enlivening sentiments it may have been amid the shadow of death that he dispensed for the delight of thousands some of the sunniest and most sparkling and sprightly pictures and that half-century of years from his matilda's death to his own were doubtless lonely years too lonely that any spirit of earth however lovely beautiful and good should ever come to supply the fatal want and by her gentle touch heal up the lifelong wound in his private record he writes long after her decease quote, she died in the beauty of her youth and in my memory she will ever be young and beautiful End quote. the early and dreadful shock thus received by washington irving about the time of issuing his history of new york doubtless had its stunning and staggering influence a great amazement came over him a shadow of great darkness fell upon him a calamity such as has overwhelmed and destroyed many a strong man confounded him and no wonder that his facile and beautiful pen dropped from his palsied hand and that life henceforth became a different thing from what it had been before happy for himself and millions more that he rallied that his head was uplifted amidst the storm and that in the whirlwind and the blasting and overthrow a soft voice of music yet whispered to him write but one and another untoward circumstance intervened and was long ere that still small voice prevailed end of chapter nine recording by greg giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida. Chapter 10 of Memoir of Washington Irving by Charles Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Greg Giordano. Chapter 10 shortly after the publication of the knickerbocker history mr irving at the solicitation of his two brothers peter and ebenezer entered into a kind of silent partnership with them with the understanding that they were to be the active agents in the concern while he being thus provided with the means of subsistence would be at liberty to engage without distraction or care in literary pursuits during much time however he seems to have made little or no literary exertion 
but gave himself up with a sort of abandon to social enjoyments the winter following his business arrangement with his brothers certain interests of the company seemed to render it necessary that he should visit washington here he remained till the close of the session in march giving apparently but slight attention to business affairs but devoting himself without reserve to the festivities and gaieties of the capital his letters tell of time passing delightfully of dinings balls dances levees interesting men fine women and the like then for two years after this he is comparatively idle though favored with a situation the most auspicious for writing and he is quote, settled down into a sort of gentleman of leisure not neglectful of mental cultivation it is true yet mainly intent upon the pleasures and amusements of the passing hour End quote. for a year or two however subsequent to this unfruitful interval of his life mr irving was induced to assume editorial charge of a monthly periodical entitled select reviews and published in philadelphia its name was subsequently changed to an electric review and during irving's superintendency of the periodical it was enriched with a goodly number of his contributions comprising reviews and biographical sketches the employment however was not to his taste the necessity of periodical writing being inconsistent with that perfect freedom as to times and themes of composition which he always so much coveted and which seemed so necessary to a full and free exercise of his genius in may eighteen fifteen mr irving embarked the second time for europe and arrived at liverpool amid the rejoicings over the splendid victory of waterloo he expresses in a letter his regret at the hard fate of napoleon and thinks it quote, a thousand pities he had not fallen like a hero end quote, in the great battle at liverpool he salutes after seven years of separation his brother peter who was acting as foreign partner in the company whose formation has already been noticed quote, i found him writes washington to his brother ebenezer the home partner very comfortably situated having handsomely furnished rooms and keeping a horse gig and servant but not indulging in any extravagance or dash End quote. after a week's visit with peter he visits at birmingham his sister mrs van wart who together with her husband and children were residing there and whom he finds quote, in excellent health and spirits and most delightfully situated in the vicinity of the town End quote. he afterward goes on an excursion to sydenham with a view to visit the poet campbell not finding him at home he spends an hour however in conversation with mrs campbell a most engaging and interesting woman afterward he visits kenilworth warwick and stratford on avon and views other interesting localities returning to liverpool the affairs of the company by reason of a protracted illness of his brother require his attention and assistance and though averse to business he for several months gives unremitting attention to the interests of the firm emerging at length from the mud of liverpool and the sordid cares of the counting-house he revisits his sister at birmingham where he finds his brother peter enfeebled and helpless by sickness owing to excessive purchases and the failure through adverse winds of their goods to reach new york in season the affairs of the company become straitened and miserably depressed nor was there a mere temporary depression but it seems to have been protracted and discouraging while its influence upon irving's mind was such as to incapacitate him for writing or for accomplishing for a time any of those favorite plans that had led him a second time over sea arriving in england in the summer of eighteen fifteen during the remainder of that year in the whole of the following he found himself entangled with the affairs of the company now in a state of comparative embarrassment yet these clouds of partial adversity seem to have not been without their chastening and solitary influence upon a mind 
whose hopes and anticipations were, perhaps, too buoyant and confiding. As the year 1816 drew toward its close, we noticed dripping from his pen such sentiments as these, quote, My own individual interests are nothing. The merest pittance would content me if I could crawl out from among these troubles and see my connection safe around me. End quote. This beautiful fraternal interest and affection seems to have been one of Irving's prominent characteristics, and in no department of his distinguished character does he appear to greater advantage. In the same connection he writes again, quote, It is not long since I felt myself quite sure of fortune's smiles, and began to entertain what I thought were very sober and rational schemes for my future comfort and establishment. At present I feel so tempest-tossed, and weather beaten that i shall be content to be quits with fortune for a very moderate portion and give up all my sober schemes as the dreams of fairyland End quote. again alluding to the blessings of fortune he adds quote, i think i can enjoy them as well as most men i shall not make myself unhappy if she fortune chooses to be scanty and shall take the position allotted me with a cheerful and contented mind. End quote. If for fortune in these extracts we substitute a more Christian term, all appears sensible and well. It may be that Irving's mind was upon the divine providence in penning these sentiments. But if so, why does he not write as he means? Why, alas, will multitudes, in their language, recognize the gods of the heathen, which are no gods? instead of acknowledging that divine hand, which is ever holding us up, and which is ever ready to lead us, if we will, along peaceful and prosperous paths. He who talks of fortune, smiles of fortune, and fortune-showering blessings, and assigns to fortune, sex and superintendence over human affairs, such a man talks errant heathenism, and so far as his language is concerned, goes out from the light into outer darkness, and affiliates and grovels with the various pagans. If it be replied that such talkers and writers means what is correct, then we ask again, why not say what they mean? What is the necessity of resorting to heathenism for terms which, in themselves, are worse than nothing, when Christian language comprises an abundance of terms having the true meaning? And who is so devoid of all sound philosophy, is not to know that language deeply affects the mind and the belief. He who adopts a heathen terminology in reference to spiritual things is, ten to one, already more than half a heathen in his actual notions. Instead of drawing near to the true God, he is inhaling a pagan atmosphere and stumbling on the dark mountains. Quote, Commit thy ways unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. End quote. Bankruptcy soon ensued with the three brothers, which, though deeply afflictive to Washington, yet his distress was evidently more for his brothers than for himself. He seems glad to be rid, at almost any rate, of the business burdens which had for so long a time pressed heavily upon him. Quote, I am eager, he writes, to get from under this murky cloud before it completely withers and blights me. A much longer continuance of such a situation would be my ruin. End quote. But a blessing comes with the calamity, for under its influence he is drawn to a better faith, or at least to a better theology. Quote, I trust in a kind providence that shapes all things for the best, and yet I hope to find future good springing out of these present adversities. End quote. Well said, you are right, young man, and according to your faith and hope, it shall be done unto you. End of chapter 10 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Chapter 11 of Memoir of Washington Irving by Charles Adams This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Thus, Washington Irving, at thirty-four years of age, is a bankrupt. In this low estate he receives a remarkable letter from Mr. James Ogilvy. Footnote. 
Mr. Ogilvy was a Scotchman of noble descent, and was, at the time of writing this letter, approaching sixty years of age. He had long before emigrated to this country, and, becoming embarrassed, he founded a classical school at Richmond, Virginia, and many of his pupils became celebrated, among whom were such names as General Scott, Commodore Jones, W. S. Archer, and others. After several years he went to the backwoods of Kentucky, dwelt alone in a log cabin, and composed there a series of deeply interesting lectures, which he delivered with great applause throughout the Atlantic States. His fame reached England, and, returning to Scotland, he, on his way, lectured in London, but with less success. The habitual use of narcotics ruined his intellect, and he is said to have perished by suicide in 1820, about three years after penning this prophetic epistle to Irving. End footnote. This letter from Mr. James Ogilvy, dated at London, and of which the following is an extract. So far as you are individually concerned, I should deem the language of condolence a sort of mockery. I am perfectly confident that even in two years you will look back on this seeming disaster as the most fortunate incident that has befallen you. Yet in the flower of youth, in possession of higher literary reputation than any of your countrymen have hitherto claimed, esteemed and beloved by all to whom you are intimately or even casually known, you want nothing but a stimulus strong enough to overcome that indolence which in a greater or less degree besets every human being. This seemingly unfortunate incident will supply this stimulus. You will return with renovated ardor to the arena you have for a season abandoned, and in twelve months win trophies for which, but for this incident, you would not even have contended. It is pleasant to note that the discouraging state of his affairs did not prevent Mr. Irving from an excursion about this time into Scotland, and from much enjoyment with friends and scenery that greeted him there. He first visited Edinburgh, and was enchanted with the general appearance of the city. It far surpassed all his expectations, and with the exception of Naples, seemed to him the most picturesque place he had ever seen. The famous rock and castle presented new aspects of beauty as often as he viewed them. Arthur's seat was a perfect witchcraft. He rambled about the bridges and on Calton Hill in a perfect intoxication of mind. The public buildings he seems to have overlooked entirely. He was utterly absorbed in the romantic features of the scenery around him so that a single day's enjoyment from this source was a sufficient compensation for his whole journey. His visit to Walter Scott seemed mutually and immensely gratifying. Footnote. Sir Walter Scott was a native of Edinburgh, born in 1771, and was allied to the border family of Scots. He was a delicate child, but grew firmer in health as he approached his tenth year, although a partial lameness began with his second year and never left him. He was educated at the high school and university of Edinburgh, in neither of which was he distinguished as a scholar. He was, however, a prodigious reader of romances, old plays, poetry, travels, and every kind of miscellaneous literature on which he could lay hands. It was thus that his literary tastes and character were shaped. He was an ardent lover of natural scenery, and his romantic feelings, begotten by the peculiar character of his reading, associated themselves with the various grand features of the landscape scenery around him. He was at fifteen apprenticed to the law in the office of his father, and after the study of six years, perusing literature largely meanwhile, he was admitted to the Scottish bar. He now soon began to write and print and for about a score of years his pen was mainly directed to poetic compositions. About the end of this time, however, his poetic genius seems to have waned, and his popularity in this department of literature sensibly declined, while at the same time the effulgence of Byron's rising glory began to blaze forth with dazzling brilliancy. From this time Scott seems to have assumed a new point of departure, and he determined to seek literary fame in another path than poetry. Nine or ten years before, he had commenced a novel designed to illustrate Highland scenery and customs in the middle of the last century, 
and the sheets seemed to have been mislaid and forgotten. These providentially now came to light, and Scott seized upon the work, and in three weeks finished the second and third volumes, and put it immediately to press, anonymously, under the title of Waverley. It proved a great success, and was the commencement of a wonderful series of novels bearing the same name, appearing in rapid succession for a term of years from 1815, the author meanwhile prosecuting besides various other literary works. By the avails of his labors, he had gradually built up for himself an ample and beautiful domain on the banks of the Tweed, to which he gave the name of Abbotsford, which became one of the most famous of literary shrines, and where he was accustomed to dispense a generous hospitality. Here it was that Irving visited him, as above described, and was so greatly delighted with the man, the family, the surroundings, and everything. A few years afterward, however, a great financial reverse came upon Scott, and by certain business connections with two Edinburgh publishers, he, by their failure, became involved in an enormous debt of $750,000 this it would seem would have appalled any man but scott he however having procured an extension seized his pen and at fifty-five years of age launched away upon a new series of literary labors astonishing even to contemplate suffice it to say that by his wonderful industry and herculean efforts he in about a half a dozen years paid five hundred thousand dollars of his debt and by disposing of the copyrights of some of his works cancelled the remainder it was a most astonishing achievement. But it killed him. Mental exhaustion came on, of course. His brain was overstrained, general health declined, gradual paralysis ensued, and in 1832, that year so famous for distinguished deaths, Walter Scott expired. He was made baronet in 1820. End footnote. The scenery of Abbotsford and the surroundings charmed Irving into a kind of dream or delirium. Leaving this paradise, he never departed from any place with more regret, and the few days he passed there were among the most delightful of his life, and worth as many years of ordinary existence. So also he was charmed with the Scott family. The wife and mother, the sons and daughters, all impressed the visitor with extraordinary interest while of Scott himself nothing but Irving's own words will do. As to Scott himself, I cannot express my delight at his character and manners. He is a sterling, golden-hearted old worthy, full of the joyousness of youth, with an imagination continually furnishing forth pictures, and a charming simplicity of manner that puts you at ease with him in a moment. It has been a constant source of pleasure to me to remark his deportment toward his family, his neighbors, his very dogs and cats. Everything that comes within his influence seems to catch a beam of that sunshine that plays round his heart. It is a perfect picture to see Scott and his household assembled of an evening, the dogs stretched before the fire, the cat perched on a chair, Mrs. Scott and the girls sewing, and Scott either reading out of some old romance or telling border stories. Per contra, just after receiving this visit from Irving, Scott writes thus to a friend. When you see Tom Campbell, tell him, with my best love, that I have to thank him for making me known to Mr. Washington Irving, who is one of the best and pleasantest acquaintances I have made this many a day. Meanwhile, other delightful friends saluted this visitor to Scotland. Geoffrey was extremely friendly and agreeable. Footnote. Francis Jeffrey was a native of Edinburgh, and was educated at Edinburgh, Glasgow, and Oxford. He was always near the head of his class, and is said to have never lost his class position without weeping. At Glasgow he excelled as a speaker and debater, and formed the important habit, which all students should consider well, of systematically accompanying all his studies by collateral composition. His residence at Oxford was far from agreeable to him where he declared that he saw nothing to acquire except drinking and praying. He soon left, and attended the law class at Edinburgh University, at the same time busying himself with literature, and was a member of the Speculative Society, a famous debating club, comprising names afterwards celebrated in history. He was admitted to the bar in 1794, but suffered for a time as a lawyer in his ardent pursuit of literature, and 
to which he was as much devoted as to his profession. He, in connection with Brougham, Sidney Smith, and Horner, planned the Edinburgh Review, whose first number appeared in 1802 with Jeffrey as editor. This periodical became rapidly popular, and Jeffrey continued its editor for twenty-six years, during all of which time he was its most popular contributor, and the whole number of his contributions amounted to two hundred. He was among the most famous of critics, pointing out the beauties and defects of compositions under his examination with wonderful thoroughness and masterly ability. The freedom of his strictures was greatly offensive to many of the distinguished writers of his time, and such authors as Moore, Wordsworth, Southey, Coleridge, and others were among those who were compelled to writhe under the edge of his terrible scalpel. Moore once challenged him to mortal combat, and so enraged with him was Wordsworth that he classed him with Robespierre and Bonaparte, denouncing them as the three most formidable enemies of mankind that had appeared within his memory. At the same time, his criticism of authors seems to have been as fully alive to their beauties and excellence as to their defects, while the former were very generally selected for quotation. Jeffrey married as his second wife, Miss Charlotte Wilkes, a New York lady, and at the time of Irving's visit, as described in a preceding chapter, was forty-four years old, and in the full ripeness of his powers. His reputation as a lawyer increased with his success as a reviewer, and he rose to the highest eminence of an advocate. He became successively rector of Glasgow University, dean of the Faculty of Advocates, law advocate, member of Parliament, and judge upon the Scottish bench. He died in 1850. End footnote. At Jeffrey's table, Irving met the wife and daughter of Dugald Stewart. Footnote. Dugald Stewart was also a native of Edinburgh, born in 1753, and was educated at the high school and university of his native city, but heard the lectures of Reed at Glasgow for a single term. At twenty-one he was chosen mathematical professor at Edinburgh, and on the resignation of the chair of moral philosophy by Professor Ferguson, he was elected his successor, holding the office during twenty-four years and enjoying the highest reputation as a lecturer. The most competent authorities, as Mackintosh, Cockburn, Mill, and others, pronounced him one of the most accomplished didactic orators of modern times, whose eloquence in his lectures, says the latter, far surpassed Pitt and Fox in their most admired speeches. In 1792 Stuart published the first volume of his Elements of Philosophy of the Mind, and the next year his Outlines of Moral Philosophy. In 1796 followed the biography of Dr. Robertson, and in 1802 that of Dr. Reed. In 1810 appeared his Philosophical Essays. Retiring from his professorship, he published several other important works, among which was his Philosophy of the Active and Moral Powers, which was completed just before his death in 1828. End footnote. Irving also met Lady Davy, wife of Sir Humphrey, who talked like an angel, and whose colloquial excellence attracted all ears, as the minister-bird drew to the surrounding trees and branches all the birds of the forest in listening attitudes. Footnote. Sir Humphrey Davy was a native of Cornwall, and was born in 1778. He was not remarkable as a boy, yet stood well in his studies, and had a taste for fishing and hunting, which he never lost. He finished his school education at fifteen, when his process of self-education commenced. He, at sixteen, was apprenticed to a physician, and commenced studying with great zeal, giving attention not only to medicine, but to linguistic, mathematical, and metaphysical studies, and especially to chemistry and physics not neglecting poetry and fiction, and on all his subjects of study he read the best authorities within his reach. In his nineteenth year his attention was first strongly turned to chemistry, and reading of Lavoisier first led him to the experimental study of the science in which he was destined to work such remarkable changes. At the age of twenty-four he was appointed professor of chemistry in the Royal Institute established at London, where his lectures at once became exceedingly popular. In 
his youth simple manners eloquence his knowledge of the subject and his brilliant experiments excited the attention of the highest ranks in london his society was coveted by all and he seemed in danger of becoming a votary of fashion rather than of science he continued here eleven and a half years devoting all his time and energies to lecturing and to experimental studies in which his enthusiasm and the excitement of his discoveries threw him into a fever and nearly finished his life rallying however his experiments and discoveries went on hand in hand and his reputation as a lecturer arose with his success and became such that he was invited to lecture in different cities received the degree of doctor of civil law at trinity college dublin and in april eighteen twelve was knighted in the same month he was married to mrs apreece a lady of accomplishments and considerable fortune and who was the lady that so astonished irving by her colloquial powers sir humphrey afterwards travelled extensively on the continent still pursuing however his chemical researches in eighteen twelve a terrific explosion having occurred in a coal mine by which a hundred men were killed davy was solicited to devise if possible some contrivance for preventing such destructive calamities hence resulted in the course of a few months the famous safety lamp an invention which has elevated davy to be one of the benefactors of mankind on its being suggested to him that he should avail himself of a patent for this invention he responded in these noble words no my good friend i never thought of such a thing my sole object was to serve the cause of humanity and if i have succeeded i am amply rewarded in the gratifying reflection of having done so davy was by universal consent considered without a superior if he had an equal among the chemists of his time he died at geneva june first eighteen twenty nine End footnote. irving's excursion in the highlands was one of the most delightful he ever made weather warm genial serene and sunshiny travelling by chaise coach gig boat cart and on foot scenery some of the most remarkable and beautiful in scotland end of chapter eleven recording by maria casper chapter twelve of memoir of washington irving by charles adams this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Thus, after three tedious years in England, during which the mercantile prospects of the three brothers went down in bankruptcy, Washington Irving, emancipated now from the thraldom of business, with which he was constitutionally unfit to grapple, again resumed his pen, and resumed it as his reliance for further support and independence through the agency of his eldest brother william who was at this time a member of congress an eligible place had been secured for washington in the navy board with a salary equal to two thousand four hundred dollars it was an office whose duties would be light and which would afford ample leisure for literary pursuits to the great disappointment of william however his brother declined this fine opening assigning as a principal reason that he did not wish to undertake any situation that must involve him in such a routine of duties as to prevent him from literary pursuits in a letter to his brother ebenezer he presents somewhat at large his feelings views and notions relating to the important position which he had assumed and which when connected with the magnificent results following his decision challenges for itself a more than ordinary interest in this letter he submits that the situation at washington would but barely sustain him genteelly that it could lead to nothing higher except politically and for political life his talents habits and taste were not adapted that he could not at the same time discharge the duties of the office and pursue his favorite plan of literary studies and that if he were ever to gain any solid reputation with the public it must be in the quiet and assiduous operations of his pen he was now thirty-five years of age, and he adds in this letter to his brother that he had already suffered several precious years of youth and lively imagination to pass by unimproved, and that it behooved him to make the most of what was left, that this was the very period of his life most auspicious for securing a literary reputation, 
and if he should succeed in this it would repay him for a world of care and privation to be placed among the established authors of his country and to win the affections of his countrymen thus it happily came to pass that irving declined office and struck out a path for himself and the sequel amply demonstrated the correctness and wisdom of this decision at the time of penning the important letter above noticed mr irving was just about putting to press the first number of the sketch-book its first publication was in this country and it was issued in successive numbers and from time to time until completed it was afterward issued in london under the auspices of the author and it was in both countries at once exceedingly popular highly approved both by american and english critics and greatly advanced on both sides of the water the reputation of its author the work comprises a series of sketches from thirty to forty in number some of them quite brief others expanded into much greater length and presenting a very considerable variety of topics authors scenery customs localities stories etc come into the scope of the work some of the sketches dwelling upon american scenery and personages but most of them occupied with english subjects over which the author seems to linger with more than ordinary partiality the series is marked by a pleasant variety not only in respect to the character of the themes but the temperament so to speak with which they are treated there will be found the sobriety of history and narrative the pathos belonging to unaffected sympathy with sorrow and on the other hand the humor by which his genius seemed so strongly characterized the style of the sketches is everywhere his own pure chaste easy flowing often elegant and always appropriate to the theme in hand rich yet not extravagant with varied and pertinent imagery pleasant flowers of speech intermingling themselves with his graceful and facile style presenting themselves not in gorgeous superabundance as in some artificial garden of beauty but constantly occurring in a sort of natural order and variety like the floral adornments that greet us as we glance along some cultivated and beautiful landscape a brief extract or two from these admirable sketches may not be without use in setting forth some of the more prominent peculiarities of mr irving's spirit and style of composition End of chapter 12 Recording by Maria Casper